Jean Bissani Ferry, EU leaders are now going to be meeting at the end of the month. They want to finalise the details of their new EU treaty fiscal compact, as it's being known. Is this, though, what the markets want, or are they barking at the wrong tree? Well, the wrong tree, I wouldn't say so, because, you know, the fiscal issue is, is a serious one, certainly, and um, you have to strengthen the, the discipline. But <clears throat> the surprising thing is that all that was done already with the six-pack legislation. So, so this new treaty is essentially repeating was what already um, in the legislation, so what the countries were already committed to with some additional changes, but uh, nothing of a major importance. And this is surprising in view of the other problems we're having in the euro area. Uh, the uh, interdependence between banks and sovereigns that has been, you know, present with Ireland, with Greece, with Spain, with other countries too. Uh, whenever uh, banks weaken, there are consequences for the sovereign. Whenever the sovereign weaken, there are consequences for banks. And this is a major factor of fragility. And this is not being discussed, this is not being addressed. So it's surprising. But there is some steps that have been taken to try and bolster Europe's most fragile bank, most notably with the move by the ECB to try and pump cheap money into those institutions. Yes, but to the extent those banks are buying additional government debt, this is not a <coughs> move away from the current structural fragility. This is a, a strengthening, a reinforcement of this fragility. And actually, if you look at data, you see that the, the proportion of government debt that is held by domestic bank has increased in all the, the vulnerable countries uh, since between 2007 and 2011. So, so it's more of this fragility that we're seeing. So what would you suggest then in terms of addressing that link, that kind of fatal link between the banks and the sovereigns? Well, I think uh, what should be done is, is really to, to, to move away from it by having banks uh, being more diversified in their holdings. So, uh, you know, on the, on the, on the bank side, they would uh, need to perhaps to hold uh, less government debt in general, but uh, to the extent they, they hold government debt, to, to be more diversified, to, 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 to hold more debt of the, you know, the euro as a, uh, as a whole, or possibly euro bonds, if there are some euro bonds. Uh, and on the state side, uh, there needs to be a move to a supervision of the larger bank at uh, euro area level, or at EU level, and the corresponding resources also to bail them out uh, if needed, to rescue them if needed. So this is a kind of banking federation. So this is not obviously secondary uh, issues, it's not secondary moves. This, is, this would be a major reform, but the logic of monetary union is really also to move in this direction in terms of financial integration. And that has been resisted and that has been put aside as an issue. Uh, I think it deserves much more attention. Now, the other logic of monetary union is um, some kind of debt collectivization. We know Berlin in particular has been very opposed to this. Do you still think that something like euro bonds, uh, collective bonds, is necessary to address this crisis? Collectivization has some uh, you know, overtones that are <laughs> perhaps intended. Um, I think the, this, is, this is part of the, also the logic of a, of a monetary union, you know, to, to, to go in the direction of fiscal union. Clearly, there are major uh, um, preconditions for that. Um, you don't want to issue a common debt if you don't control the issuance of debt by your partners. And who can uh, control? It has to be an EU or euro area, uh, most probably euro area uh, institution, and an institution that is le politically legitimate. So this requires political integration. Now what we're seeing is that there is no uh, appetite for political integration on the part of several members of the euro area, especially France, which is very reluctant uh, to any move in this direction, especially in the pre-electoral period. So nothing can move until um, there is this question of what is the, the quid pro quo for possibly introducing Eurobond um, is solved. Listening to you, we're looking at medium to long-term reforms that are required, but we still have an immediate crisis, particularly in the southern European states. So do you think that there's any indication that we can overcome that in order to basically save the Eurozone this year? You know, any indication that you're moving uh, <coughs> towards um, addressing the more fundamental problem can be interpreted by market as an indication that the Eurozone is strengthening. There is a 
doubt about how, how strong it is, how, how vulnerable it is, how blasting it can be. And so any message that goes in the direction of strengthening, drawing the conclusions from the weaknesses observed is also uh, something that, that may buy, you know, um, support, credibility for the euro area. Um, the other thing for the, the southern European countries is that they are adjusting, they have to adjust. Now the question is whether there will be a grow uh, environment, uh, growth environment that will, uh, you know, give some possibility of payoffs for reforms. My fear is that as this government implements simultaneously consolidation packages and further consolidation packages in response to a weakening uh, macro outlook, uh, at some point, you know, they have nothing to show to the public opinion but an increase in unemployment and a weakening of growth or a recession. And for governments that are committed to, to, to reform, uh, you know, at some point you have, even even it, you have to go through the suffering. At some point you have to show something, and the question is when are those governments be going to be able to show something? And I think that's something for the whole of the euro area to think about how to create this growth environment.